call this meeting to order. Today is February 10, 2023. This is the 24th meeting of the Subcommittee on International Human Rights. Today's meeting is taking place in a hybrid format pursuant to the House Order of June 23, 2002. Members are participating by Zoom and in person. Uh, just a few comments before we start. Um, before anybody uh, takes the floor, you have to be recognized by the chair, and I'll recognize you. Those who are participating by Zoom, um, there is a icon on the bottom of your screen, you can, the globe icon. You can either listen to the language, original language, both English and French, or an interpretation, and in either English or French. And pursuant to the standing order of 182, a subcommittee is going to be studying the issue of the Chinese government's residential boarding schools and preschools in the Tibetan autonomous regions and all Tibetan autonomous, region, autonomous prefectures and counties. We have four witnesses with us, uh, two in person and two participating by Zoom. As individuals, Ms. Chami Le. Lahmo, um, community organizer and human rights activist. Thanks for being here in person. Dr. Gail Lowe, academic researcher and educational sociologist. Thanks for being here today. From Human Rights Watch, Ms. Sophie Richardson, thanks for being here today. And um, Tibet Action Institute a witness, uh, Ms. Ladon. Tete Young, uh, director, who is also participating by video conference. We're going to have five minutes for each witness. We'll start with those uh, in person. I'll give a hand signal at one minute. There's one minute left, 30 seconds. And then you'll just have to conclude your remarks. Chair, if you don't mind, can I make a request for um, perhaps Sophie to go first, Laden to go second, third, Dr. Jallo, and lastly, me. We can do that. Um, usually, I recognize you. So for other interventions, uh, let's do that. But we'll start off with, um, from Zoom, uh, Sophie Richardson, please, for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you so much for having me. On behalf of Human Rights Watch, we appreciate the opportunity to participate and also wanted to pass our congratulations on for the extraordinary passage of M62 last week, which was a wonderful uh, effort to, to behold. Uh, Human Rights Watch uh, began tracking language medium education issues in Tibetan areas more than a decade ago. Uh, when proposals to phase out Tibetan medium instruction in Tibetan areas of Qinghai province prompted protests that were crushed, the January 2016 arrest of Tashi Wangchuk, a language activist, suggested that Chinese authorities were taking a harder line on the issue. Nevertheless, it was extremely difficult to document policy shifts. However, in March 2020, we were able to publish research showing that, consistent with Chinese Communist Party Secretary General Xi Jinping's broad and aggressive assimilationist campaign of cynicization, Chinese authorities' claims to providing so-called bilingual education to Tibetan children was quite simply a lie. Our research showed that the policy carried out for the past decade across what Chinese authorities call the Tibet Autonomous Region and in Tibetan areas and other provinces has actually increased Chinese medium schooling at all levels except for the study of Tibetan language itself. Under the guise of improving access to education, Chinese authorities established compulsory bilingual kindergartens to immerse Tibetan children in Chinese language and state propaganda from age three in the name of strengthening the unity of nationalities. They also hired thousands of non-Tibetan speaking teachers from other parts of China under the Aid Tibet program and the promotion of ethnically mixed classes in which if even one Chinese speaking child was present, the entire class would be taught in Chinese rather than in Tibetan. In September 2019, parents and teachers in six rural townships in Nagchu Municipality in the Northern TAR told Human Rights Watch that as of March 2019, their local primary schools had switched to using Chinese as the language of education. 
These are violations of international human rights law and of the Chinese constitution, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights stipulate respect for mother tongue education. UN Committees on the Rights of the Child, Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, and the Elimination of Racial Discrimination have all expressed concern over the rights of Tibetans to education in their own language and culture across China. China's constitution guarantees minor minority language rights. Moreover, these policies are also in profound tension with best practices with respect to education, which strongly suggests mastery in the mother tongue prior to learning other languages. It is worth noting that many of the Tibetan parents to whom we spoke stressed that they wanted their children to learn both languages, but not at the cost of learning in just one of those. These policies are a profound threat to Tibetans' identity. The Canadian government should not only raise its concerns about these practices in bilateral meetings and international forums, but also actively support the preservation of Tibetan medium education, including teaching materials uh, and teaching materials and teachers. I'm happy to provide more recommendations, but I want to make sure not to exceed my time. Thank you very much. You, you still have uh, two minutes. One, oh, one minute, 45 I seconds. <laughs> I was much too efficient. My apologies. Uh, Congress is terribly strict. Uh, perhaps then I can fill in some of the details. The Chinese government, we think, accomplished uh, the implementation of these policies partly through some very deliberate ambiguity uh, about what teachers and schools were meant to do. But often when faced with uh, access only, for example, to Chinese medium materials for teaching, uh, schools had no choices but to use those materials since there simply weren't Tibetan medium uh, uh, materials available to people. Uh, similarly, the restrictions on the languages that the teachers who were being recruited themselves were, ca were capable of teaching in tipped the balance in many different uh, circumstances. I think the fact that we've observed the authorities persecute, I think not just prosecute, but persecute individuals who have spoken up in defense of Tibetan medium education makes very clear that what might be considered a, 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 a not terribly incendiary academic matter in other contexts is part of a larger political campaign. And it's consistent with what we have documented with respect to other critical components of Tibetans' identity, not least uh, the, the extraordinary encroachments on Tibetans' rights to uh, religion and how it is practiced. We've seen similar uh, changes in policy and management of religion by Chinese authorities. That, that effectively encroaches on individuals' abilities to live their identities as international human rights law guarantees them the, the right to do. Thank you. And we'll continue on with Ms. Uh, Ladon Teong. Teong, sorry for the pronunciation, for five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for this opportunity uh, for making this happen. Um, I will read my remarks and I'm going to time myself here because it's best if I help myself keep time. Um, so thank you. My father was born in a free and independent Tibet in 1934. My eldest brother was born in a Tibetan refugee camp in India. I was born on the land of the Songhees and Esquimalt nations in Victoria, on Vancouver Island. As a Tibetan and a Canadian, uh, my two worlds sadly collided a couple of years ago when my organization, Tibet Action, began researching reports that Tibetan parents were being forced, coerced, to send their children, including those as young as four and five years old, away to boarding schools. In the course of our research, we found that uh, China had been constructing a massive colonial boarding school system in Tibet, one that threatens the very survival of the Tibetan people and the nation because they so wholly and completely have targeted the future of Tibet, our children, and even the very youngest ones. This school, this school system is the cornerstone of a broader effort to wipe out current and future resistance of our fiercely proud Tibetan people by eliminating our language, our religion, and our way of life. And the colonial boarding school system itself streamlines and fast tracks this genocidal plan. 
by ripping Tibetan children from their roots, stealing the language from their tongue, and attempting to turn them into something that they are not. Just um, some high-level findings from our report. At least 800,000 Tibetan children across all of historical Tibet, not just the Tibet Autonomous Region or what China calls Tibet, uh, representing 78% of all Tibetan school children ages 6 to 18 are now separated from their families and living in colonial, colonial boarding schools. And this number does not include the four and five-year-olds being made to live in boarding preschools in rural areas because China is actively trying to hide the existence of that system. These children are forbidden from practicing religion. They're cut off from authentic Tibetan culture beyond, of course, what the Communist Party approves of and what you'll see in the propaganda, which is wearing Tibetan clothing and doing Tibetan dance, circle dance. These kids are taught almost entirely in Chinese, maybe with one Tibetan language class, uh, by mostly Chinese teachers or increasingly more and more Chinese teachers and from Chinese textbooks that reflect China's life, history, culture, and values, and completely what completely denies Tibet's own rich and ancient history and culture, our stories. On top of this, they're subjected to intense political indoctrination. Sophie has said it in the past, even the youngest children getting intense political indoctrination like Xi Jinping thought. Um, it says they must be loyal to the Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese nation first and above all else. And of course, Tibetan parents have no choice but to send their children to live in these schools because the authorities have closed the local village schools, along with most privately run Tibetan schools or monastery schools, and not to mention that Tibetans having lived 70 years under Chinese occupation and facing intense violence from the state know that you can't resist these kind of central government directives at the grassroots level without facing severe, severe consequences. Uh, parents who resist or refuse are threatened with fines and other serious consequences. And of course, the children have no choice. Uh, one person from Tibet described the situation like this. I know this is a quote. I know of children aged four to five who don't want to be separated from their mothers. They're forced to go to boarding schools, and in some cases, they cry for days, sticking to their mother's laps. Both the children and the parents are unwilling. This insidious policy to isolate children from their families so as to erase their Tibetan identity and replace it with a Chinese identity was developed at the highest levels of the Communist Party. And it is blatantly a racist policy. Just as Tibetan parents don't want to have to send their children away, Chinese people don't want to send their children away either. And actually a backlash against school consolidation policies in China led the state council to rule in 2012 that all levels of school should be in principle non-residential, especially for the uh, young children in grades one to three. And that very same state council had decreed in 2015 that in so-called minority areas, officials must strengthen boarding school construction and achieve the goal that students of all ethnic minorities will study in a school, live in a school, and grow up in a school. Ms. Tedung, so if you could just wrap up. Mm -hmm, since releasing this report, we've been asked many times by, from many people why the world doesn't know. How did we miss this? Um, and I just want to say that the total information blackout and lockdown of Tibet has resulted in such a dearth of information from Tibet that there's and no foreign media, Tibetans can't get in or out, transnational repression, punitive measures against corporations who might quote the Dalai Lama or governments who speak out in favor of Tibet. This has resulted in this silence by design. And what's happening in Tibet is a crisis. It threatens our ancient civilization. And it is in a way like a genocide 2.0 because it's happening in real time right now, but with no pictures, very few, no videos, and no one really able to report what's happening from the ground, unlike any other place on earth. And so I would ask the Canadian government, all of you, to help us expose this system because the Chinese government is trying to hide it and just pay special extra attention to bringing to that up in every possible way with Beijing and continuing to push the Chinese government for the human rights and freedom of the Tibetan people because 
they are working very hard to erase us, not just inside to that, but in the world at large. Thank, Thank you. you. And we'll continue on. Thank you for that, Ms. Tetan. Um, and we'll continue on uh, with Dr. Gale for five minutes. Um, thank you, all of you, uh, for allowing me to speak to you about the system of the colonial boarding school in Tibet. I am here to share my research findings and uh, what I have personally uh, witnessed about the boarding preschool as this is a completely hidden policy of the Chinese government. Based on the most <clears throat> more than 50 boarding preschool I have seen with my own my eyes, I estimate at least 10 hundred thousand Tibetan children from age four to six are now li living separate from their parents, family, and a community. After I received my PhD at the University of Toronto, I returned to Tibet in 2015. I then started teaching at the Yunnan Normal University. The following year, my brother called me uh, because he was concerned about his two granddaughters' behavior. I went home to see them. This was the first time I came in contact with the colonial boarding preschool. I picked up my two grandnieces, uh, one age four, one age in the age five, from their boarding preschool on Friday evening and then carefully observed them while they were at home. Um, clearly, I saw they did not hug their grandparents and had uh, almost no emotional exchange with their own family members. They sat a little further from away from all of us, family members, almost like guests or strangers in their own home. They converse uh, with each other only in Mandarin and Chinese language. This was after just three months in the new boarding preschool in our local township. Prior to this, they spoke no Mandarin and were raised in the and an entire Tibetan-speaking environment, I realized that my family's case was not unique. The Chinese government was implementing a mandatory preschool education policy overall Tibet. For the following three years, I, the, during the summer vacation, I did academic field work on this topic. I visited boarding preschool across all eastern Tibet, what China now calls Qinghai, Gansu, Yunnan, and Sichuan. I spoke with kids, parents, teachers, and other village stakeholders. And my conclusion was the same as with my two grandnieces. It is very important to understand that Tibetan parents have no real choice about whether to send their children away to the boarding school, even those very young children in the rural area of Tibet, just age four to six years old must attend a boarding preschool. Local village schools have been shut down. The Tibetan private schools have been shut down. There are really no local options, and no Tibetan option left for parents who don't want to send their children away to those government boarding preschools. This is all by design. The Chinese government invests the vast amount of the resource and the much careful thought into pulling the Tibetan children out from our culture and from their family by the roots. 
They do this by teaching almost entirely in Mandarin in the Chinese language and by making the environment, entire learning environment into a pure Chinese environment. Even the pedagogical approach is very sophisticated. For example, students were showed Chinese cultural object and then told them to close their eyes and imagine the, the object. And then they asked to the, draw what they uh, imagined. So later on, they asked kids to explain what they have drawn in Chinese Mandarin. This is a very intentional method to shift children's entire psychological foundation from Tibetan to Chinese. China is weaponizing the school system, intentionally committed to genocide. I am deeply concerned for the well-being of those children, their parents, and the future survival of Tibetan identity and culture. If this colonial boarding school policy continues for more than 20 years, especially the boarding preschool policy, I fear China will end our civilization and the cause the re irreparable harm to our people. Thanks very much. I stand here. Thank you, Dr. Gale, for your testimony. And last, we have um, Lemo, please, for uh, Miss Lemo, for um, for five minutes. Thank you. Tishile, Ani, bonjour, hello, everybody. I'm Chimi Lamo. But before I begin, I want to acknowledge and express my gratitude to the original caretakers of this land, to the elders of the past and present, and to any who should be here and may be here today physically, mentally, and spiritually. I was born a stateless into a Tibetan refugee settlement camp in South India. And until I was 11 years old, I carried not a passport, but an identity certificate issued by the Indian government, which I needed to renew every single year to maintain my precarious political existence as a person with no homeland. At 11, I emigrated to Toronto to a neighborhood called Parkdale. Parkdale has one of the largest Tibetan communities in exile outside of India and Nepal. It's one of the very few places where Tibetans have recreated both our national identity and our cultural community in a safe place that allows us to be who we are. Where we celebrate our culture, learn our language, study our scriptures, and pass our rich ancient heritage to the next generation. Every Wednesday we gather in Little Tibet to celebrate those parts of our identity and culture that are banned and criminalized inside of Tibet. So culture, culture is often referred to as the way of life of an entire society. It's the collective programming of the mind. For a community, that guides the collective action, thoughts, and feelings. It's what makes us unique, human. It's part of, it's part of what dignifies our existence and gives meaning to our lives. However, China's colonial rule over Tibet has targeted and has continuously attacked every aspect of this culture. Language, faith, music, literature, our nomadic way of life, our ancestral branches of knowledge that have allowed us to live for as compassionate stewards of the one of most fragile ecosystems in the planet. The Chinese Communist Party has basically severed our entire nation into two. Those on the outside who cannot go inside because we're denied visas, and those who are inside cannot leave because they do not have passports. That has been the fact of a Tibetan life for a long time. And now, the Chinese government's assault on Tibetans has reached a breaking point. Chinese authorities are targeting the three foundational pillars of our Tibetan identity, religion, language, and our nomadic way of life, for a complete elimination. This eliminationist project is being carried out in every space, in the monasteries, workplaces, primary nursery schools, on the grasslands and towns, neighborhoods and private homes. There is no Tibetan space that remains beyond the intrusive reach of the Chinese state today. Millions of nomads have been relocated from the grasslands into reservation-style housing projects, which basically land them in the middle of nowhere with little to no access to jobs, so there's no future for young people to survive or even thrive. In the monasteries, monks are being 
monks and nuns are being slowly strangled with rules and regulations that push them out and block new ones from joining. And for those that remain, there's no time for religious studies because they're too busy studying Xi Jinping's thought and the latest propaganda by Beijing forced upon them. For anyone who's paying attention, there's no doubt that the Chinese Communist Party is hell-bent on trying to eradicate our core identity, turning Tibetans into Chinese. That alone is the final goal of this cradle-to-grave project of forced assimilation, starting with the mandatory enrollment of four- to six-year-olds in preschool boarding. Not to mention nearly one million children are being stripped away from their parents, forced or coerced into learning, thinking, and even imagining in Chinese instead of Tibetan. So I stand here today as a Tibetan and a Canadian to ask you to please speak out for Tibet. Our silence emboldens the CCP. That's why we see them blatantly sending spy balloons around the world. That's why they're setting up police stations in our democratic nations, interfere with our elections, threaten and intimidate Canadians on Canadian soil. It is imperative that we take a stand and we act. Now, some may say that Canada has no place speaking out because of our own legacies. Yet, I say this is exactly why Canada needs to speak out. This is precisely why we have even a greater duty and moral obligation to speak out. We know from our own mistakes from the, about the intergenerational trauma and the grief caused by these type of schools, about the genocidal legacies that they leave behind for generations and generations after. We need to speak out, speak out about our experiences, what could be done differently and make sure that it never happens again, neither here nor anywhere else. There's so much that we can do to help Tibet. One, just issuing a statement that echoes the concerns of the four UN special rapporteurs and call on China to shut down these colonial boarding school systems in, inside of Tibet. That includes Kamenamdo. Two, this body can definitely take a study, undertake a study to investigate the CCP's colonial preschool boarding that there is no information, that the Chinese government is clearly hiding, doing everything they can to hide this policy, because even they know that this is wrong. And we need to make sure that folks like Dr. Jallo and the experts that are risking their lives to be here in front of you today to tell you the truth about these hidden policies of the Chinese government are taken seriously. Thirdly, to impose sanctions on these Chinese officials and these architects that are overseeing these colonial boarding schools under the Justice, Justice for Victims of Corrupt Foreign Officials Act. Finally, I want to thank you, you and each and every single person that's listening today because together we can do this right and make sure that it doesn't happen again anywhere else. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lemo. And now we'll uh, move on to um, questions. Uh, our first round will be seven minutes. Um, first will be Mr. Abulteyev, then uh, Mr. Vrani, and we'll continue on uh, with the other members. Mr. Abulteyev, for seven minutes, please. Thank you. Thanks for the witnesses for appearing uh, today before committee. Um, uh, Ms. Uh, Lamo, you've done uh, answer. You've answered some of the questions that I was going to ask you. Uh, by outlining the um, final strategy of the uh, Chinese regime uh, or the Chinese uh, Communist Party um, uh, over the Tibet region and the uh, Tibet population. Um, but the question that back itself uh, about this, those residential schools is when was uh, this problem um, was known to the international community and, and to Canada? When was the highlight on this uh, took a place? Um, you're talking about 20 years from now, there will be probably complete um, uh, a change of the culture, the education system, the way these uh, generations are going to grow uh, to, uh, to the future. Um, uh, so I, I like, I think it would be important to understand when was this uh, uh, issue become known to the international community and to Canada, and what have you been hearing from the, uh, um, from the international community on uh, this uh, issue? So the question to Ms. Lamo and I believe uh, to the Tibet Action Institute, uh, Ms. Titon. Thank you. I believe uh, Ladunla would be a, um, a great speaker 
to respond to your question because they actually put out the report in 2020 and the international community has definitely responded. We see UK has spoken out. We have also attached in the briefing document the letter by Congressional um, Congressman Jim McGovern from the CECC that have called out China to, to basically shut down the colonial boarding schools. Uh, we need Canada to step up. UK has risen. U.S. has risen. U.N. has also done their own research to tell us that one million children are basically being ripped away from their parents. So it's time for Canada to join on that. Ladunla. Yeah, thank you. Um, it really has just been this last year. We put the report out uh, and we're briefing some governments behind the scenes just before uh, last December, so, or, so a year ago December. Um, and then, uh, yeah, there has been there has been some forward movement now. I think with the UN Special Rapporteur speaking out uh, recently, they just put out a press release on Monday uh, about their communication to the Chinese government, calling for more information on the school system and and saying that it appears to be in violation of basically every agreement the Chinese government has made on, on the, any rights that Tibetans might have. Um, but they are, you know, the, the, this is in a way, so I think Dr. Gello always says it best. I mean, there have always been colonial boarding schools in Tibet the entire time the Chinese government has been there. He was part of a wave of academics and scholars and Tibetans trying to hold a line and push for Tibetan content and curriculum in those schools for years. That space has steadily been shrinking. And to the point now under Xi Jinping and the second generation ethnic policies that the last number of years, they've really taken it to the next level in terms of, you know, primary school education no longer being taught in Tibetan and now preschool. And it didn't used to be Tibetans had to attend preschool, though it would be great if they were attending Tibetan language based, mother tongue based preschool. Tibetans would have no problem with that um, and not having to do that in a boarding school, but locally. So this is all new under Xi Jinping, and it's like we see in general. Dr. Gelo, a tour uh, Eastern Tibet, as uh, per your testimony, um, what I would be curious to know, have you had a chance to look at the curriculum, the academic curriculum that uh, is taught to these, or these, uh, let's say it's imposed uh, on these students? Yeah, uh, let me address the two parts. Uh, the colonial boarding school started in 1979 until now they are running, but the situation getting worse and worse. On top of that, under the Xi Jinping's regime, they newly produced a new policy for the uh, having the boarding preschool education system. And I deeply engaged uh, with the curriculum issue and the text contents of the textbook over the 10 years when I was in a teaching in my univer former university. Um, for example, we, I produced a two Tibetan knowledge-based uh, text, textbook. And I did also, also did the, some of the training uh, conference. Then uh, one, uh, one year after, the China stopped that. Would you be able to give us some examples from these textbooks that um, raise a flag over what they're trying to do, what the Chinese government is trying to do, and how that is going to really affect the future of these young uh, generations? OK. Yeah, uh, it's a. Uh Autonomous, they're making the pure Chinese autonomous field cultural environment for the kids in the school. For example, they shut, they shut down the uh, Tibetan object or Tibetan historical figures, the Tibet, Tibetan cultural environment in the classroom in 2019, uh, 18. And also, they're asking kids to wear the Chinese soldier uh, dress as a uniform. And also, the every day required to sing the Chinese national song in the one day into the school. I have a question here, too, because we've got about 30, 40 seconds. Um, 
have uh, do parents uh, uh, or is pa parents uh, able to visit their uh, kids in those schools? Um, there are two types. The, the boarding preschool, the parents only allowed to pick up them on the Friday evening and drop them the Sunday evening. Those are kids the age four to six. Other boarding school area, they almost every three months they can see their parents. Thank you, Mr. Uh, now for seven minutes, Mr. Vrani. Uh, 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 Mr. Chair, uh, I want to start by saying to Jiche and Tashidle. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Ms. Richardson, for your uh, contributions as well. Uh, and thank you to the members of this committee and to the chair for facilitating this important meeting and this important study. Um, in my seven years representing the community of Parkdale that uh, Ms. Lama was mentioning, I've certainly learned a great deal about Tibet and the Tibetan struggle. Uh, and in my role of chair of Parliamentary Friends of Tibet, I've taken some encouragement. Uh, at certain times in terms of the way things were heading in terms of government policy and sort of international reaction. Um, this testimony today, however, is quite shocking. So the encouraging parts are things such as, you know, launching an Indo-Pacific strategy that specifically mentions Tibetan human rights violations. It's things like the vote that happened in December on relaunching a Sino-Tibetan dialogue that has been stalled since His Holiness gave up uh, political power to the Sikyong. And really, that dialogue process has been moribund for about the last 10 years. Um, I think having this study is really, really critical, and I'm glad we're having it. But what I want to know, I guess, first of all, is in terms of sort of um, the impact on the children and also the impact on the parents. So perhaps, Dr. Gallo, can you tell us very specifically what would happen in uh, the TAR or in, in any Tibetan majority region if a parent outright tried to refuse sending their kids to either the preschool or to the uh, boarding schools ages 6 to 18? What, what are the consequences? Okay. Yeah. The parents, uh, seems like they almost have no, any possible way to oppose the policy uh, to send their kids to uh, school because they warn them First, uh, if you don't send your kids to pre-boarding school, then later on you cannot get enrolled in uh, grade one, which is uh, you won't get the education. Uh, second is going to simply block you in the, your name from the government system when you get uh, benefit or any welfare from governments. And then they in, still you don't send it, and then they p send the police to put you in jail. In that context, the children would be removed by force. Is that fair? Of course, they're going to keep maintaining the school. Okay, and I want to turn to Ms. Lamo because you... Uh, referenced uh, sort of the legacy of Canada with respect to residential schools, and we're all thinking about the Indigenous plight for 150 years in this country, and it's a, it's a horrific legacy. A lot of that legacy is also about children trying to escape, flee, run, trying to resist. Is there evidence, and perhaps uh, uh, Dr. Gyalo, uh, Laden Tetang, or Sophie Richardson, is there evidence of children trying to uh, get out of the system, and what happens to them if they do, if they do try to resist in the, in the schools? Uh, there's uh, two options, very clear. Uh, one option is they're going to uh, uh, grab you to send, uh, drop back you to school. Uh, other way is you, you keep, they put you in the, another far distance of school. You'll never be able to run away. Move you even further. And tell me, how has this been exacerbated by, and if, if, if Ms. Richardson or Ms. Taitung want to join in this response, but how has this been exacerbated by the rise of sort of the surveillance state under, under Xi Jinping? I understand that there are two cameras for every human being in the PRC, for example. That is quite overwhelming. But how does that impede upon one's ability to resist or flee in, in this context? So perhaps Ms. Richardson or Ms. Taitung? Thank you. Just briefly, uh, Human Rights Watch has done uh, quite a bit of research about the surveillance state 
uh, across China and the ability of authorities to monitor virtually all any sort of uh, any and all electronic communications, but also indeed to use tools to track people's movement. Uh, uh, and I think it's fair to say that the Tibetan plateau is awash with this kind of technology and it's deployed in ways that prevent people from being able to communicate or organize. If I can just add briefly about the impacts on children uh, and family members, we had people talk to us about the inability of, of children to communicate with family members. Uh, once they had really been forced to study entirely in Chinese, uh, that children obviously were not able to read uh, traditional texts and that they were not able to participate in religious rites because they simply didn't have the language comprehension to do so. And I think that those are some of the ways in which you can so clearly see the destruction to families and to the transmission of knowledge uh, simply by switching out the medium of education. But Laden will certainly have more to add to that. Yeah, um, we've actually had reports from uh, Tibet, very limited, but we have had reports just of even Tibetan students in these schools protesting um, the crackdown on language, the removal of Tibetan from, because this has sort of intensified over the last number of years. And, um, you know, we, we try to look into these things and it's virtually impossible because the information blackout was so complete. Um, uh, so that's, you know, we also... Um, one thing I would just say about the impact on children and families, we've actually heard from a number of Tibetans who felt like they had no other choice to send their kids, also felt like, well, at least if my child learns Chinese like I didn't, then they will have a better chance because this the world all around them is changing so quickly. And actually then they expressed regret later that the kids that came home to them were just in so many ways different and they had grown so apart and it just broke, broke them. It made them feel they had made the wrong decision. Ms. Tetong, if I could just further go further with you on one issue. You mentioned sort of the discriminatory application of these policies, and I recall reading from that UN longer document that the, while these schools exist, they're applied to some something like 22% of minority children, but to 78% of Tibetan minority children. So can you comment upon that, upon the direct application in, like, over-application towards Tibetans and what you read in that vis-a-vis -vis the, gov the Chinese government's policies? Yeah, the, the so... In r the most rural areas of China, um, where you would think that, you know, if this is really about what the Chinese will say, the challenges of, of uh, the sparsely populated Tibetan plateau and the, the um, topography and just how difficult it is to get to school, um, in, the, in the most rural areas of China, the rate of boarding is like 20-ish percent, um, 20 something you know average across and so it, it really isn't there's no comparison they just this is targeting not just tibetan children uyghur and mongolian southern mongolian children as well but of course in east turkestan or xinjiang what they trying to call the xinjiang uyghur autonomous region there's there are different circumstances because many of those kids parents are in camps or detent you know in, in detention um and for the southern mongolians they've really fought back against language policies in a way that has helped on some level to sort of delay a bit more. But we have we don't know all of the details because it's so difficult to get information, but we know that they are also at boarding at a very high rate. I think Tibet is always kind of next level. It's always, and sadly, a little ahead of everyone else because of Tibet's uh, political claims to independence and history. The Chinese government treats it, very, and the global support that Tibet has enjoyed, the Chinese government treats Tibet very, very, very differently in, in, in many ways earlier than, say, the other places. Thank you, Ms. Tedon. And we're going to continue on over, continue Evic and that uh, question. We will continue to hear from our next member. Uh, Mr. Prindel Ducept, you have seven minutes, sir. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to all of you for being here for this highly important study carried out by our committee. I am one of your allies. I have spent time in China, but don't worry about that. Ms. Tetong, I was hearing you say you've told us that some families regretted their choices given that the effect um, was pernicious on the children was negative 
So tell me, should a family refuse to send their child to a residential school, is it possible, by the way, for them to send the child? And if they don't, what are the sanctions, what are the reprisals carried out by the government on the family? So there, there used to be, thank you for that question, there used to be more options and they have been shrinking, shrinking steadily every year. So um, Tibetans could send kids to some Tibetan private schools or the monasteries were running schools for secular education, these kind of things. And the Chinese government has cracked down on all of it. So um, when I say that choice to send them, some parents would have some years ago had a somewhat of a choice between a Tibetan run school or this school where they're really gonna get a strong Chinese language education. And in the case where they made that decision for whatever reason, that's what I was talking about, that kind of regret. And then the consequences really, so one thing that is is very clear to us um, in, in our research is that for many of the Tibetans who want to resist or who try to resist, they've just gotten much better at pressuring people before they even consider getting to the point of not sending. What parents do, which really reminds me of the stories of the residential schools in Canada that I have heard, Parents now are moving to urban areas because there are day schools there. So they'll move the whole family or not the whole family. They'll separate the family, move with a child or children to the urban area so that the kids can go to a day school or they will live in there like with the with the four and five year olds. We've heard of nomadic communities taking turns family by family going and living near the school, though they can't even see the kids. But just so someone from that community is near those kids and living in their car all week long. Um, and, and, and yeah, that's, those are the kind of stories we're hearing now. Thank you very much for your answer. We have heard of the pretty much ban to speak Tibetan for these children. These children have to give up their culture and their religious practices. And of course, the Chinese school is based entirely on uh, China thought, socialist thought, and so on, communist thought. When a child exposed to this sort of training imposed by the Chinese government, what are the effects on the child? What's the results, all said and done, on a young Tibetan who has been forced to attend such a residential boarding school? When they come out of it, is it the same person or have they really been changed? Um, thank you for your question. This is a key question, I think. Um, when they came, uh, as I mentioned in my statement, uh, right after three months, they uh, feel like become a guest and a stranger at home. This is how they pulling uh, our kids from their roots, uh, started by uh, from home. Wait. Yes, and this reminds me, well, of course, one must uh, be careful when we compare situations, but there were residential boarding schools here for indigenous peoples who were forcefully assimilated. And in Canada, the reconciliation underway, you know, has led to that being called by some a cultural genocide. And what's going on in Tibet is a cultural genocide. Would you be ready to put it that way? Uh, yes, definitely. This is a, a clear symbol of the uh, cultural genocide, I think. Under the Genocide Convention, separating children from their parents is stated as a genocide. And even at the risk of um, it being a genocide, we, as part of the international community, have an obligation to ensure that we intervene and, if need be, punish the perpetrators. Yes, you've uh, reached pretty much my conclusion, and that's what I was about to say. Canada has signed the Convention on Pact on Genocide involving the ban on genocide, and once you sign such an international agreement, we have obligations, and Canada has obligations. Do you think that Canada is doing enough as a signatory of the 1958 Geneva document? Do you think we're doing enough? Because, uh, you know, that uh, 
pact is clear, that convention is clear, rather, when there is a mere risk of genocide, we are held to take action. And if we're not doing enough, what should we do? We've provided the recommendations, but I'm happy to repeat them. Uh, do you, in response to your question, or do you think Canada is doing enough? This is the opportunity to do something. Uh, it's been about a year and a half where uh, experts, Dr. Jallo, Ladunla, have been going around the world tirelessly. I know Ladunla has to spend time away from her own little ones, uh, running back and forth. She was just in Ottawa, had to go in flights as they, ca as they were cancelled, and being separated f for this very reason. The sacrifices being made is for Canada to be stepping up and make the actions to be able to make sure that children are no longer being separated from their families so that we can act on our obligation to intervene. Il reste 20 secondes. And in what way should we take action to um, live up to our obligations under the covenants? What should we do? How should we take action? It's nice to say we should take action, but how? Ms. Tetong, I think you wish to answer. Yeah, I think, um, so leadership, I think, would be very helpful. So amongst like-minded nations at the UN to raise this issue, first and foremost, it sounds very basic, but the Chinese government is hiding this policy for a reason and is cutting the flow of information for a reason. And so that's because if no one knows it's happening, then there's no problem and no problem needs no solution. So first and foremost, if, if we need to, to directly condemn this uh, policy to bring it out and to put Beijing on notice that the world knows. And that's just like basic. Also, I think you will all appreciate the idea that Tibet is often mentioned as just Tibet added on to long um, statements about other things. So, and Tibet, and we are concerned about Tibet. We appreciate the continued concern for Tibet, but to really name specifically uh, the policies to talk and look into the question of genocide, I think it will become quite clear what is happening is far beyond just a human rights violation, you know, and that's something that happens also to us as we sort of get uh, put in a category as if there's just these individual violations, but what, what China's Xi Jinping's approach is, especially now, is so apparent. It's a total um, approach that is um, designed to eliminate Tibetans in a way that's clearly genocide and it needs to be addressed in that way. And I think Tibetans, Uyghurs, Southern Mongolians, our issues need to be looked at together. You know, I think Beijing would love nothing more for us to keep all of this in silos and say this is a anti-terrorism issue, this is a separatism, this is a, you know, and, and it's just too easy to, in a way, let them off the hook for the genocidal policies that they have towards everyone who was, you know, especially Tibetans, Uyghurs, um, and and Southern Mongolians who are not Han. Thank you, Ms. Tetong. Uh, merci pour ça aussi, Monsieur. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Brunel Lesep. Thank you. Thank you for your answers. On with Ms. McPherson for seven minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you for for your testimony. This is this has been very helpful for us. I I know. Um, you know, I'm, I, I'm a mother, and, and I can't even imagine the stories that you've been sharing with us this week. When I heard your testimony earlier in the week, I, it, it's all I can do, you know, to not rush home and hug my children just a little bit, a little bit closer. Uh, so certainly, I want to express my, my sympathies and that this is happening. <sighs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm slightly overwhelmed by, by the testimony, to be perfectly honest. You know, I, I like many of the other members of this committee, um, and banned from China because we have spoken out against against the genocide happening against the Uyghur people, um, and and I guess why I, I feel a little overwhelmed is is that that you raise the issue of of being being making statements using the Magnitsky style sanctions um, things that, that Canada can do and it, it feels so fully insufficient for what needs to be done. Um, I'd like to know, though, what what has China's response been like? So the report has come out. Um, you you are speaking internationally. We've had the UK, we've had the US, we've had other countries um, raise this and talk about this. What what has China just fully denied? What has China's response been to this? Mr. Ms. Teton, either of you. 
Ms. So just quickly, <laughs> and maybe Sophie could follow up with how China responds. Um, to this, our specific charges about the residential boarding school system, they um, haven't said that much, although they have had some direct responses. They haven't responded to the UN, but they did put something out some time ago, I think through the Canadian Chinese embassy, if I'm rem remembering correctly. And they just completely denied it and they point to their propaganda online that shows, say, Tibetan children learning Tibetan, or they have these slick videos that shows Tibetans learning Tibetan. And um, quickly people will say, well, how you say they're not learning Tibetan, but here they are learning Tibetan. And, and I just wanted to point out that, the, and I think all Canadians can understand this, um, that one Tibetan language class being taught in Tibet to Tibetan children where they are studying nine, 10 hours a day in Chinese is not enough and will not result in these young people, especially separated from their families and communities, speaking Tibetan or being Tibetan in that way. Um, so that's one thing the Chinese government will just point to their, um, their, and they have pointed to their very carefully constructed propaganda and whatever to show that, you know, and Tibetans dancing and singing. And uh, they have some, they have some stuff online that I think is really telling propaganda where the questions that these interviewers will ask the young Tibetans, either print or a video, the answers of the young people are actually quite telling of how they miss their family and how they weren't happy really for a long time, homesick. I mean, it's all there, but everybody knows to be very careful in Tibet and how you express yourself, Chinese state media. Um. Ms. Richardson, anything you'd like to add to that? Thank you. If I could just add quickly, the Chinese government now reflexively rejects anything that we publish as hopelessly biased and, and fictional. And we as an organization have been sanctioned, uh, which is not really relevant except to show that there isn't, there's never a substantive conversation about the facts. Uh, uh, and the Chinese government generally continues to insist that it is merely making education maximally available to the largest number of children and that this is all uh, to the public good. I think it's worth pointing out that in the 2010 decision to make uh, to, to expand access to preschool education across all Tibetan areas and particularly in the TAR, this made preschool education effectively compulsory. And so when we're thinking about what the what the what the what the knock-on effects of that are, one of them is that it is now effectively impossible to enroll your child in a school at subsequent levels if they have not been to one of the state-run uh, uh, preschools, whether it's a boarding school, whether it is not a boarding school. But it's effectively, there's no, there's no option anymore. There's no meaningful option uh, to step away from the state-run system because it would mean effectively taking your child out of all education at all levels. Uh, but the Chinese government has been particularly disingenuous in its responses to the concerns also raised by the Committee on the Rights of the Child and the Committee to Eliminate Racial Discrimination, both of which have repeatedly flagged this problem uh, since the 90s with Chinese authorities. And typically the, the state's response is to just respond with the number of children in the aggregate who are being educated without answering the question about access to mother tongue education or the denial of that right. Well, and and certainly, I mean, you you talk about the multilateral um, institutions that have that have looked at this, the, the the multilateral fora, and you know, obviously, we saw with the Uyghurs that the UN, the HRC, was not able to get that study, that they were not able to get the votes to to make that study go forward. Is that a role Canada should play? Should we be trying to work with allied countries to 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 inoculate against uh, against um, Chinese influence of other countries is that a role that we can that we can play I cannot urge you strongly enough to do that Canada was very supportive of the October vote and I really hope that that governments will think about that episode not as a failure but as being 18 votes closer to yes you are 18 votes closer to yes these things are almost never adopted on the first go I hope everyone is suiting up not necessarily for the March session, but for June, to go right back into the council and try to run the same decision memo. And, and I guess just as you know, as you people voted last week, beautifully, movingly, thank you. You voted for them. Those people deserve their rights. There should be a debate in the Human Rights Council about what's happening to Uyghurs, about what's happening to Tibetan children. 
And I think leadership from the Canadian government in this regard is incredibly important. Well, I have some, some I'll just prep it for my next round, I guess. But Mrs. Tatong, you talked a little bit about the, the, the Tibetans being, their issues being separate from Uyghurs, separate from Mongolians, separate from, from Hong Kongers, perhaps, separate from Taiwan, whatever those issues are that, that, the, that we're dealing with, with with regards to Chinese aggression. The, the next round, because I know I'm out of time, but the next round, I think maybe if you could articulate a little bit about how we treat Tibet as separate, but also treat it as part of this bigger issue. And so I, I know I can't get you to answer that right now, but I, it'll circle around. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Thank you. Chair. Um, and uh, thank you, Ms. McPherson, uh, for that. We'll continue now to f for five minutes with Ms. Vanderbilt. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you so much uh, to, to our witnesses uh, for this vital testimony. Um, I, I do take note that uh, it was said that China is going to great lengths to try to have an information blackout and not let it be known what is happening to Tibetan children. And the fact that, you know, I just want to particularly thank you, Dr. Lo, um, you know, as a teacher and your deep caring of children, but the fact that you were able to bring us direct recent testimony that you saw yourself, uh, I think is vital for this committee to be able to hear, but also to be able to amplify. And I actually thank all the members of the committee from all parties that we were able to get your testimony sort of squeezed into our calendar to make sure we had an exceptional meeting today uh, so that we could have this on the record, uh, which I, I hope will go some way in making sure that this is known in the world. Um, my, my question, um, and, and I, I take note that, um, you know, Ms. Richardson, you mentioned uh, an attempt at sinusization. Um, there's, uh, I, I know that um, Ms. Tetong, you said something about uh, looking at all of these issues together. And you know that this committee uh, was the committee that I think was almost first in the world of any parliament uh, to study the Uyghurs uh, back in 2018, what was happening there at a time when China was trying very hard not to have uh, information public on this. And I noted that there are some eerie similarities uh, in the surveillance, in the, um, the, the attempt to completely eradicate a language and culture and, and people by taking their children. Um, I wonder to what extent this is something that uh, we know that um, Tibet, I think it was Ms. Tetong who said it's the canary in the coal mine. Uh, it, Tibet is sort of ahead. But at the same time, I imagine that these techniques, the technologies, the um, this is being shared and learned from. Uh, we noted with the Uyghurs that it was um, the same governor uh, that had been in Tibet who then went to Xinjiang. And I wonder to what extent China is using this against all of its minorities uh, in a much grander sort of attempt to um, to eradicate uh, different peoples. Uh, if you could, I'd like to start with uh, Dr. Lowe, um, and then if each of you could answer uh, answer that question. Thank you. Uh, um, thank you for your question. And of course, um, over the years, when I was in teaching in my former university, I had a number of the Mongolian and Uyghur uh, colleagues. Uh, we often shared experience, exchanged ex uh, ideas. Uh, in the university, uh, during the official meeting, we pretend we don't know each other. But in the evening, we invite each other for a certain place to get dinner together. So we had that kind of experience. Uh, that experience is not simply uh, to respond to the government's pressure on us as a intellectual uh, people. So uh, throughout those experience, uh, it's, it's clearly I can see um, there are similarities be between uh, boarding preschool in Uyghurs, in Xinjiang, and in Tibet. It's exactly the same. Uh, there's no differences. But um, on the other hand, there are some of the strategic 
difference between the China treating Tibetan and Uyghurs. Um, for example, I can see, I can share with you a concrete uh, example. In 2017, uh, Shanghai Social Science Academic did a social survey on that. Uh, what's the difference between from uh, Tibetan and Uyghur from their perspective? They think, uh, wrap out Tibetan from urban city, let them back to their rural area, and then kill out the Uyghur uh, from the every city in, in China. That's kind of a different attitude they have uh, from Chinese people's side. family members, the children acting like strangers in their home. I think every single parent and grandparent and aunt and uncle are, um, can, can, can relate and are mortified at that very thought. So thank you for that testimony. Um, Ms. Lamo, would you like to, uh, to, to talk a little bit about the, the way in mm -hmm. which this is between different cultures and different uh, races as well? In, in yeah. very brief oh. comments, please. Sorry. Yeah. For sure. I want to start off by saying that there's cross-movement solidarity, and you've seen that with the Beijing Olympics. I was actually in Greece with my Uyghur and Hong Konger friends, uh, some of us detained and arrested in different jails, but we were together. Um, and the Chinese government's tactics, it's so clear that they're constantly duplicating the tactics used by other authoritarian regimes, whether it is surveillance, whether it's stripping, uh, ripping people children away from their families. Uh, I just want to emphasize this point. Tibet has been on lockdown by design since 2008. Prior to 2008, thousands of people were able to escape. We, we used to get information from experts like Dr. Jello oftentimes. After 2008, only a trick or are able to make it through. In the past years, maybe five or handful have been able to get out. And so I would like to encourage people to think about how do we... What type of information have we heard in, from inside of Tibet? The access that we have. We were able to see the concentration camps in East Turkestan. We have not yet been able to see the boarding preschools that even the UN has not reported in their communication so far. The boarding preschools, we still do not know. So access, access, access. Thank you. And now we'll continue on to Mr. Jenis for five minutes. Thank you, Chair. This is obviously very moving and tragic testimony. Uh, I want to start by asking if you know of uh, instances or mechanisms of complicity by Western uh, corporations uh, or, or consulting firms uh, that uh, might be involved in uh, investing in or supplying equipment technology uh, for, for these boarding schools uh, who we should be putting pressure on to end that uh, complicity. Anybody can answer, right? Yeah, who, who feel free, any, anybody. And in general, if a witness has some commentary to give, even if the question's not been directed towards you, you can still contribute. So anybody, please. Sophie, did you want to do the DNA, the, just the quick DNA link of thermals? Sure. This is this is not specific to uh, to boarding schools, but several years ago, when we were writing about uh, the forced collection of biodata of Uyghurs, we came across procurement documents suggesting that a Massachusetts-based company, Thermo Fisher, uh, had sold DNA sequencers to the Xinjiang authorities. It is, it was not then, and it's not now illegal to sell those sequencers. That doesn't mean it's a great idea. Uh, or, or consistent with, uh, you know, ethics or basic human decency. And no amount of publicly beating up this company really seems to have uh, made them change their behavior. They said they would stop selling that technology in that region. We subsequently, we and others found the, their technology unsold into the region. They said it wasn't their fault. We can go into details if you want. But recently, uh, uh, we and others have found the same company selling the same equipment to authorities in the TAR. Uh, and that, and and published in September, showing that that authorities okay. are collecting. Sorry, just 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 because of the tight time, uh, are there other? Could you give us the name of the company quickly? And are there other instances of other companies or consulting? Or, and and if, maybe if if people don't have that information at their fingertips, uh, I think the committee would love to receive a, a written follow up submission. 
I know it's it, it may seem a little bit obscure, but I think one key way that we try to combat these human rights abuses are to hold accountable those we have the capacity to hold accountable to a greater extent because they're based in our societies. I'll send the links to the relevant okay. documents we've published. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else want to add to this quickly? And then I'll go to another another topic. Yeah. I was just going to say that we are looking into, um, who, you know, who there is that we could hold accountable entities or or whatnot. One thing that's a kind of an interesting new area, but it's really clear for us, especially because Dr. Gallo has knowledge of all these people and characters, is the um, the intellectual architects of these second generation ethnic policies that Xi Jinping has adopted, um, and the people overseeing the implementation, not just in Tibet but also in East Turkestan or, or the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, um, that, that those people are actually um, some sanction from the highest level of the state government, uh, the central government, to go into Tibet and East Turkestan and find the fastest ways to implement across the board um, Tibetan Uyghur children speaking Mandarin and what's the best way to what are the best uh, methods, psychological and otherwise, to get them to learn faster? And if you can imagine, you know, what this, these people to us are not academics, they're not researchers, um, it's next level and it's genocidal and they should be held accountable, the individuals involved, right. especially if so that, they are deputized. Yeah, that, that sort of anticipated my next question, which was, you know, we're, I think we'd be interested in, in getting suggestions of, of, uh, corporations that might be involved in in uh, being complicit in this uh, that that uh, uh, should be should be highlighted, sanctioned, uh, and and we can also put pressure on our and we are putting pressure on our pension uh, fund to to not invest in areas that are going to be complicit. So is that whole? But then there's also individual accountability via Magnitsky sanctions, uh, and there have been, uh, to my knowledge, no application of Magnitsky sanctions to individuals involved in repression in Tibet. Uh, or in Hong Kong, there's been some very limited use in the context of uh, of East Turkestan. Uh, do you have names of individuals uh, that you could forward to the committee and say, these are people we know are uh, playing a role specifically around these uh, these boarding schools uh, and that, that they should be held accountable via Magnitsky sanctions? Personally, I think that can be a very powerful tool for for deterring uh, this kind of involvement is, is to is to have a clearly named names around accountability. Just a quick answer in 30 seconds, please. Absolutely. We couldn't agree more. And actually the state department did in December sanction two officials in Tibet and I can send you the info. Um, and that was hugely, hugely momentous for Tibetans. Um, and it's new and a lot has been going on in the world. So I don't think many people actually know about it. The other thing is we can absolutely send you some information. Uh, about okay. individuals I think the, involved. the committee would appreciate those names that I assume to include in uh, potentially to include in a report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Jenis. And we'll continue now for five minutes to Mr. Brunel Doucet. Thank you, Chair. I'll pick up on what my colleague, Member Garnett, has just been saying. We are here in this committee to draw up a report with as much evidence as possible to allow us as parliamentarians to take action, at least to uh, require certain things, ask certain things of the current government of Canada and the parliament. Could you um, say more then about very specific situations at uh, these residential boarding schools. Could you give us more details, if possible, so that we could put it into the report? And this is for any one of you. Ms. Richardson, I see you uh, nodding. Share the details of all of the reporting that we've done on education policy and abuses related to it and about sinicization more broadly across the region, if that's helpful. Many of those documents also include, as Mr. Genus was asking, uh, the names of the relevant officials. But Ludna and others may wish to elaborate on that with respect specifically to, to the boarding schools. Um, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, of course, we have uh, who is architecting uh, that program. The certain name I know personally for many years. I can provide his name. And also, there are uh, institutions settled by Central China 
government of China in Lanzhou. They are uh, responsible for re doing the research on the Western, entire Western minority area, which is uh, largely uh, covers Xinjiang and the Tibet. Thank you. We'll be happy to take anything you send us. We're very lucky to have extremely efficient analysts who will help us draw up something based on what you share with us here for the committee. What we see, as most of my colleagues